Hey, it's Jose Galison. This is No Way Jose. You can find me on the No Way Jose YouTube channel, also on all the major podcatchers and Odyssey as well. Today, my guest is Reed Coverdale. Um, we will be covering, uh, we'll be doing the Lysander Spooner portion of the Anarchist Handbook, uh, to which I've already done quite a few. We'll give you a quick little rundown of what I've done so far. I did Sterner with Magnus Pinvidia. I did the Murray Rothbard chapter with Dave Smith, the Emma Goldman one with Thaddeus Russell. Uh, Benjamin Tucker with Ace, um, did Lewis Ling with Clint Russell of Liberty Lockdown, David Friedman with Jeremy Kaufman, I did the Hook Die Anarchy uh, episode myself, and Charles Plunkett with Top Lobster. So if any of those interest you, go check those out as well. I hope you guys like this. The goal is to eventually do all of them, and then maybe I can get Malice on for the Malice episode. If not, maybe I'll settle for the failed podcast uh, caster like Tom Woods or something like that. Just kidding. I probably won't be able to pull that off either. But we'll see. Um, just so you guys know the format of what's going on right now, if you are watching right now on the 22nd, this is a live stream and it is public. Uh, this will be going unlisted almost immediately after the, after I'm done. And that will only be basically available for my patrons at that point. I used to do the stream behind it. I just changed it cause it made some issues with like, uh, with, um, I'm going to brain fart with uh, super chats and stuff. You couldn't super chat when it's unlisted. And then also it didn't, I like Another thing you guys can do basically is now the day after, if you don't want to pay, if you don't want to be a patron, whatever, you can catch us on Odyssey. Almost immediately after the stream, it will go up on Odyssey because the channels are mirrored. Doing it this way allows it to do that. I mean, I'm sure there's probably another way to do it, but I'm too much of an idiot to figure it out. So this allows an incentive for you guys to go to Odyssey, which I like. You guys should go to Odyssey. I mean, there's a good chance. I mean, maybe not so much in my channel, but like channels like Tower Power or something will probably get nuked eventually. This one, maybe one day um and you know i definitely need to have a backup on odyssey so go check that out uh i did mention the patreon um so the patreons patreon.com just no way jose 2020 uh the lowest level is two bucks and that gets you the very basic that just gets you uh the access to the episodes in the meantime there's differing levels it goes all the way up to twenty dollars and the twenty dollars the sponsor level uh and that's where i just lift off my list off my sponsors at that level at that level i have cd mcray of the whiskey and tea podcast at space cat 2k which i just had on because the ten dollar level gives you a uh allows you to uh curate your own episode um within reason i mean if you're trying to get me to do something i can't I have, i'm not able to talk on at all i mean uh it's something we'd work with basically if you're on that level if you're my patron hit me up and we'll, we'll talk it out and i already did that one with space cat 2k we did agri agorism versus session or or you know like in quotes first because i don't really see them as opposing each other uh, I also have Jacob Winograd of the Daniel Three Biblically a Biblical Anarchy podcast. Uh, he's the dude. Uh, he'll never be on Tower Power Hour, though. Um, so, anyways, I do want to give a quick rundown of what's going on with the other channels. Uh, you got Tower Gang. We have Dave Smith coming up on the thirtieth. Uh, I don't. Reed will probably give us a rundown if he's got anything interesting coming up soon. I know he just on the eighteenth he had Maria Farner, and that was a really good episode. I checked that out. Uh, a lot of good stuff there. Dropped a lot of big names. As always, go check out Top Lobster at toplobster.com. Use Jose at checkout for 10% off. Uh, we are partnered. Me and all the Tower Gang homies are partnered with Top Lobster now. So, you know, help him out. Help us out. You know, you, you can go to the site. You'll see, like, you know, little icons. He redid the website. All set up for Break the Cycle, Tower Gang, uh, Liberty Lockdown, um, fucking Naturalist Capitalist, um, No Way Jose, if I said that already. And, yeah uh all right that's it i'm gonna go ahead and bring in reed and we'll get to it what's up man how's it going dude good, good uh you want to introduce yourself for people who don't know you uh i mean this makes sense because this is a uh, the anarchist handbook series so there might be people checking this out that haven't checked out my other ones or aren't really in this sphere so i mean if you want to give a quick rundown of who you are uh, and we'll go from there Sure. Uh, it's actually kind of cool you're having me on right now because right about a year ago, exactly almost, or I think a year ago today or yesterday was kind of when I, um, it was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back that made me think I might be an anarchist. It was when uh, Congress passed the uh, COVID relief bill that none of them read. Uh, that was the second largest spending bill in U.S. history right after the CARES Act, which was passed in March the same year and um, you know hundreds of billions of dollars to foreign countries the military um, you know this is right after the military 700 billion dollar budget had been passed like two weeks prior so it just kind of crumbled my um, 
my uh, you know my view of what government could possibly be. So I've been an anarchist for almost a year, but I've been a libertarian since like, I don't know, 2014, 2013, 2014, 2015, somewhere in there. It was it was sort of an evolutionary process. Uh, and I have a podcast, The Naturalist Capitalist, that I've been doing for a little over a year and a half now. Uh, and it's really blown up this year. Had a lot of big guests like Peter Schiff, Abby Martin, uh, Dave Smith, Tom Woods, Ryan Dawson. Uh, you know, it's just <laughs> it's been incredible. So. It's been pretty cool to see that happen. And I'm a heavy haul truck driver. So I kind of bring a working class perspective and attitude to the podcasting scene, which is kind of needed because there aren't too many. I mean, as you know, there aren't too many people like that. Like we actually use our hands for work. So, you know, yep. it's kind of nice <laughs> to add our perspective. Yes, it's a uh, it's a rarity in our circles. It's a it, it is funny the uh, types of people in our circles, and then you know then you have like me, you, Clint, people like that. Uh, for those who aren't aware, we are kind of uh, loosely associated. Me and Reed are both uh, Tower Power Hour hosts. Uh, we're, we kind of all we're we're the gang essentially, or part of the gang. So, and it was a uh, it was nice to have Reed on for this one. I was looking forward to it. Uh, this is like I've been trying to make every one of these episodes kind of special. And uh, this this one's special as well. Uh, Spooner has a special place in my heart for me for uh, for you know, just give you guys a rundown. I, I I said before I did the Dave episode. Uh, I'm sorry you don't do outdo Dave. Uh, that was more special. Uh, but you are my homie. But at the same time, the anatomy uh, of the state was what made me an anarchist. I read it and I was like, holy shit, uh, that's what did it for me. But then probably the next thing after that was like was this, and like because I, I still had had this love of the Constitution. But Lysander Spooner does a really, or Spooner does a really good job of just being like in the most autistic legal argument type, you know, breakdown of like of this giant sprawling argument that builds upon itself, which is what basically you know no treason this book is. Uh, how the Constitution is just essentially in every every which way horseshit, um, and we'll be going through that today, obviously. So, but yeah, it was the the thing that came after Naomi State because Naomi State, I was like, okay, I'm an anarchist, but I was still had this like. But, you know, like at least the Constitution was kind of a valiant effort, kind of. And I, I guess I still kind of believe that. And it was one of the, it was like that thing where you're like, ah, well, maybe you know, it's cool. I mean, if only they they stuck up, they st uh, stuck uh, stuck to it, blah blah blah. But then you read this and you're like, oh. Um, so I guess with that, I guess I'd like to hear like what it was to you because I believe we talked before and you said this was like kind of one of the books that did it for you. Yeah, I almost had the opposite thing. I read this mm -hmm. book before. Or I listen. So I don't I very rarely actually sit down and read a physical book. I usually listen to them because I have to drive all the time. That's the only thing I have time to do. But I listen to it twice. And then I actually listen to Anatomy of the State afterward. And so for me, like this kind of broke the back of the logic of the Constitution, because I was a very like Justin Amash style approach to government and Constitution like we need government, but it needs to be held accountable to itself. And that's why we have all these checks and balances. That's why we have a constitutional republic, not a democracy, blah, 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 you know, the whole nine yards or whatever. And so you're right. Like this kind of just blows that all out of the water. And then you read anatomy of the estate after. And then that's like just, you know, kind of <laughs> just says, well, the whole idea is bullshit anyway, even if it did work, basically. But um, I think you got to be like, you got to be right for uh being an anarchist like you have to be hit with these thoughts at the right time like if these thoughts had come across me in 2016 or if, sorry if this book had come across me in 2016 it might have not done it it was like the perfect timeline in my life for me to read this book and just go like wow uh, after seeing 2020 and like you know that that whole the quote that really stuck with me of course is whether the constitution be one thing or another it has either authorized such a government as we have had or been unable to stop it. In either case, it's unfit to exist. That just like encapsulates 2020. So it was just like the perfect time for me to read it. And it, um, like you said, it just logically um, tears down the idea of this document. Yeah, and I guess we'll get into it now. But uh, um, I guess I did want to touch on too. Uh, you brought up how you do have to be kind of ready for it. I, it is kind of funny. I brought up the Dave episode. Uh, it part of why that episode was so special for me was because it was literally listening to part of the problem for years that finally got me to read Anatomy State because he would always bring up Anatomy State and I would I wasn't ever I was always that minarchist would listen to Dave and then he kind of like an anarchy lamp like eh, okay 
And then I finally was like, all right, whatever. I'll give it an say the chance. And that's what did it. So that's, it was kind of weird full circle having Dave on to discuss that as part of the anarchist handbook series. Uh, and he was the one who basically made me anarchist, made me read it. And we're covering that book. Uh, but anyways, let's, let's get into it. I, I did think it, I did want to point out real quick. And I guess it kind of touches into what we were just talking about now. Um, and you know, the, the quote that you brought up and how it perfectly sums it up. Um, you know, Ace, Ace Archist on Twitter, he did an even better job of summing it up than probably even Spooner did. And uh, as such, uh, Malice actually put it in the forward of this chapter uh, and gave, well, actually, I don't know if he put it, gave credit there, but I mean, Ace didn't care. Um, but he put, um, <clears throat> the Constitution is like a no gun zone sign for conservatives, yeah. which, I mean, it, that's basically a good way of summing this up. And it, it does, it is fitting that it's in the forward for this chapter. Um, all right, the first part gets into how the Constitution has no authority or obligation at all to begin with. And, <clears throat> like, for example, it starts out saying that uh, it's a contract. It was only a contract. It does not so much as even purport to be a contract between people now existing. And it's like it says it's only a contract between people living 80 years ago. And that's a big thing of this is, like, the Constitution is supposed to be a contract. So, and that's where he builds off of this. And this is, like, the starting point that he starts from. Um, and he goes, furthermore, we know historically that only a small portion, even the people then existing, were consulted on the subject or asked or permitted to express even, either their consent or dissent in even, any formal manner. So he basically goes into the whole point of the, like this was, you know, at his point, it was something like 80 years ago when he, he was doing this. I don't know when it came out for us. It's been hundreds of years. And it was essentially a, a, a few handfuls of people or a few dozen people. I don't even know how many people were there for the signing of the constitution, but not that many, probably less than all, or roughly, I don't know. Someone's going to fuck and, you know, hit me with history shit, <laughs> but not a ton. And especially when you're yeah. talking about like to, to make a contract for the entire United States, it's like in the whole, and one thing he builds on, and you have to keep in context of this book is that he's like, he goes into that. Supposedly this is built on consent, this whole government. And he, he starts out from here working from there. So, and now he breaks it down. Like if it's on consent, the idea that, you know, 50 to hundred, however many people, you know, voted a couple hundred years ago. And now we all are supposedly bound to this is ridiculous. Uh, but then he ends off this first portion with, he goes into, if then those who established the constitution had no power to bind, did not attempt to bind their posterity. The question arises whether the posterity have bound themselves. If they have done so, they can have done so in only one or both of these two ways by voting and paying taxes. And that's when we get to the next part. Uh, I will say for those listening, this is a very, I mean, I wouldn't say it's a big book, but I mean, you know, so far as, uh, you know, in the interest of the anarchist handbook, it's something like, I think 60, 70 pages. So we will be breezing over a lot and he goes very in depth in all these arguments. So, and we're not going to be able to cover that completely. So I highly suggest you go read it. So we will probably breeze over some of the stuff. Like even in that thing, he goes into full on artistic, uh, like multiple reasons more than more than just what I gave you of why, even when it first was made, it didn't really bind anyone. Um, I don't know if you have anything on that. And then we can get into voting because that's the next section. Yeah. So um, I think that another similarity between us, we talked about this the first time uh, I came on a year show is that we're both atheists and we used to be, christians and for me the journey to anarchy it was later it was like five years later but it was very similar to the journey from christianity to atheism and one thing that always struck me as weird about christianity is that because adam and eve you know ate the forbidden fruit the rest of us have to suffer for it it's like what like why aren't we given the same chance in the garden of eden and people are like oh no well you do have free will it's like yeah but they weren't born into original sin why do I have to be born into original sin? Why don't I get a chance in perfection and to decide if I, you know, um, and just like the whole like dislocation of, you know, fairness and equal judgment and, um, you know, basically a binding contract, you know, it, it didn't really make any sense. And then this kind of fit right in perfectly with that. So the uh, spiritual journey I went on, kind of primed me for this anarchist journey because there's just so many parallels that I see with it. Um, and that was, I think, what really struck me as obvious about the signing of the Constitution. It's like, yeah, this is years and years and years ago when I wasn't even alive. I was never asked about it. And then even the people who were alive, they didn't represent everybody who existed. Like, did you ask everybody who you were representing if they want, you know, <laughs> to be in on this deal? So it, it, it just kind of all made perfect sense to me, I guess. 
Yeah, no, and it's funny. We covered a lot of this, and I think our first episode we ever did together forever ago. Uh, but yeah, the, how we both came to this through atheism and like, uh, not, and I'm not even trying to make it like an atheism theism argument here, but it's just I know right. when I was exploring that, I had to really get in, learn, into learning logic. And then from there, that lo- those logical tools apply later, which I mean, it very much is like if you read Spooner, he's basically making an like a complete logic argument. This is like basically the best way to describe this book is a legal argument. Um, like it's like you, you read it and he is just like point by point by point and the, the argument builds upon itself. Uh, all right. Now he says um, – no, it goes into the section on voting and um, – it kind of goes into how basically the idea is that like, you know, like how because the whole basic basis of this is that like uh, the Constitution supposedly build on consent. And so then a lot of times people say, oh, well, voting, that's consent or taxes, that's consent. And so he kind of he's breaking down voting and how it's consent or so. Uh, in, so first off, he says the act of voting could only bind the voters. And so then it comes to the point of the non-voters. Uh, he goes into of the one six they're uh, able to, they're permitted to vote because at the time he's going to like only so many people were even able to vote, which right. I mean, I obviously I can make a hopping argument how that's pre- preferable and like, you know, because, you know, we don't like direct democracy. But the point being is this is supposed to be built in consent and voting is supposed to somehow, you know, confer consent and you only allow a certain amount of people to do it. There goes your argument for consent. So um, and. So and then he also goes into how by voting, you, you like really you can only pledge yourself for that amount of time that like it would if if we're buying the argument that voting provides consent, it would only be for that period of time. Um, and then also he kind of goes into it really would only work if it's perfectly voluntary, which I mean maybe some agorists and you know may disagree, but it is pretty fucking um, it it's not very voluntary if you think about it because the things that are up for vote are the things of your concern like your property, your taxes, stuff like that. So the idea being like, hey, we're going to vote on whether we should take more of your money. And it's like, can we really say that's completely voluntary? It's like, because you're essentially putting someone in a situation where you're like, uh, it's not really necessarily voluntary if they're like, well, I mean, this is my shit you're voting on. Uh, I, I, it's, yeah. Uh, someone brought up uh, his other works. I did want to touch on that real quick. Someone brought up the thing. Uh, I actually have, when I read Spooner, I went a huge tear. He has a lot of great work. I will say No Treason's his best work, but definitely go check out his work. Especially, like, uh, he has a lot of, like, little, I read this book. It was all his little, like, letters and, like, uh, or, like, uh, newspaper articles and stuff. And he is insanely based, uh, Spooner. He, he is a, he he is, like, like his life is, like, a goddamn adventure. Like, it, it was it was pretty nuts, some of the shit he did. Um, but anyways, on voting, do, do, do. So, like, here's a good line from it. He sees further, if he will but use the ballot himself, he has some chance of relieving himself from this tyranny of others by subjecting them to his own. In short, he finds himself without his consent so situated that if he uses the ballot, he may become a master. If he does not use it, he must become a slave. Um, which, that was kind of the point I was getting at. Uh, um, I don't know if you have anything to add. I'm just kind of looking through other points on voting. Uh, oh, and then he kind of goes into how many votes are given for candidates who have no prospects of success. And like, he even goes into how voting can literally be the opposite of consent as well, because, you know, say we're libertarians here. I mean, shit, like we're, we're both like, I mean, you're friends. I'm like a friendly acquaintance with Dave Smith. Uh, he's, you know, flirting with the idea of running for the LP, a vote for Dave would not really be a vote for the constitution. Like anyone who thinks that it's kind of silly. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean that's kind of how it is. Um, did I lose you? You there? I'm here. Can you hear oh, okay, me? so you have such a blank stare that sometimes I can't tell if the it's, fucking thing went or not. My, my, my resting trucker face. So <laughs> <laughs> you're so still. It's it's weird. <laughs> uh, but you're the um, first person to say that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so like obviously, like there's protest votes. That's not really someone that's a vote for that. There's also the opposite of even the people working in the, 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 you know, the D and the R paradigm. Even then, you could make the case that um, if someone voted for fucking uh, voted for Trump in the last election and they got Biden, did they really did they really consent? Not right. really. I mean, that's the exact opposite of they wanted. Um, so let me see. Uh, and that's I mean, there's obviously there's way more that we can go into. He has like something like 
11 or 12 different reasons. Uh, but he basically, in a shitload of ways, breaks down how voting does not at all confer consent. Uh, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. <laughs> we'll move on to taxes. Yeah, I mean, it's just, uh, I think, anatomy in this. I think it's, uh, no, actually, it's for New Liberty that kind of lays this out well, where it's like, you know, imagine if, imagine there's no government, but you just gave a mob or a, a gang, you know, if you gave tower gang, a literal gang, you know, like complete jurisdiction <laughs> over everything, and you just gave them all the guns and all the money and all the power and everything, and then you had them fairly distributing everything. Um, everyone would be like, what? That's absolutely insane. Why would you want to do that? So if you're, that's what you're voting for. You're only voting for seizure of property, seizure of money and use of force. That's all you're ever voting for. If you think about it, that's all the government is. So how can that in and of itself be consensual? You know, you're voting on how much of your neighbor's money you think you are entitled to which is ridiculous. I mean, you know, they cloak it in fancy words like, oh, we need infrastructure bills or we need, you know, we need uh, more defense or we need whatever. But if you actually break it down, it's, oh, how much more of your neighbor or this business or whatever are you entitled to? So, of course, it's not consent. It's how much are you, how much do you want us to forcibly steal from somebody else? And that's really yeah. what it comes down to. So, which perfectly segues into taxes. <laughs> that's what we're, yeah, that is a common thing is they say taxes are voluntary and, or, and as, as such they they confer consent, which anyone who really thinks it through understands it's not. Um, he says, the fact is that the government, like a highway man says to a man, your money or your life, the highwayman takes solely upon himself the responsibility, danger, and crime of his own act. He does not pretend that he has any rightful claim to your money or that he intends to use it for your own benefit. He does not pre pretend to be anything but a robber, which is pretty great how he goes in that. And he like essentially says that like ro like thieves are preferable to uh, essentially the government since at least they don't try to fucking you know, gaslight into you into thinking that it's for your own good or that you chose to do it. Um do, do, do. Uh, it's still another reason why the payment of taxes implies no consent or pledge to support the government is the taxpayer does not know and has no means of knowing who the particular individuals are who compose the government, which that's another point he gets into within this is that what even is the government, which, you know, like I said, this is a very sprawling, lots of shit, so we won't be covering all of it. Um, so not knowing who the particular individuals are who call themselves the government, the taxpayer does not know whom he pays his taxes to. Um, I'll put one more line here and I'll, I'll give, see if you have anything to riff off of. Uh, that every man who puts money into the hands of a government puts his hand, its hands a, into its hands a sword which will be used against himself to extort more money from him and also to keep him in subjection to his arbitrary will. Uh, which, which that I put a little note. I put agorism. I always got to bring it back to that. Which I mean, obviously we know it's not voluntary, but you can. I mean, everyone has their little ways to squeeze what they can, and you know why give them any more money they need. Um, you know, keep it for yourself, <laughs> better yourself, and not the state right. to the best you can. Um, oh, one second. Here, here's another one. It's a perfect absurdity to, to suppose that any body of men would ever take a man's money without his consent. For any such object as they profess to take it for, that of protecting him. For why should they wish to protect him if he does not wish them to do so? Suppose they would do so is just as absurd as it would be to suppose they would take his money without his consent for the purpose of buying food or clothing for him when he did not want it. And that leads to an earlier point you had in there and how like, oh, you know, well, we, we take this for protection. And you're like, well, what if I don't want to pay it? Like, well, you're going to fucking pay it. Um, and... You know, like it's also like, well, why can't I just, you know, protect myself or, or use this money to pay someone to protect me? Um, but yeah, I don't know if you got anything else. You look like you perked up for a second there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that last line, I think, is the best one because the, the, the whole taxation is theft argument, it always made logical sense to me. But I guess the threshold I wasn't crossing over was like, well, how else are we going to do it? You know, it was always like, yeah, of course it's theft. But you know, it's a necessary evil, I guess is what I used to say. And then that last line there, like how ridiculous it is to think that they're going to steal your money to take care of you. Like it doesn't make any, I mean, they, they never actually do it. So, you know, we had just been through the year 2020 
where, um, you know, I can personally attest to this. I paid, uh, I made a lot of money in 2019. I paid $20,000 in just federal income tax in 2019. And 2020, I didn't make nearly as much money because I only worked like half the year. Um, but I made enough money in 2019 to not get any stimulus checks in 2020. And then, you know, after paying 20 grand into the system, seeing how they were using it, like sending, you know, ships to foreign countries and new airplanes to Egypt and half a billion dollars to Israel or whatever. Like, it was, I mean, it's just this idea that they're take they're forcibly taking your money from you for your betterment. It's complete bullshit. Like, regardless of whether or not you think they should be doing it and they should be doing something good with it, they're not. I mean, and why would they? Like, why would they steal your money? To better you it doesn't make any sense so i think that last line you just read there that kind of perfectly encapsulates the yeah. the confusion i'd arrived at or not even it was the clarity throughout the confusion like it had this confusion and that was kind of clarity like yeah of course they're not gonna take your money to create something better for you that doesn't make any sense of course they won't yeah and it, it's like it's funny when you take it because for some reason people have this weird idea when it comes to security or protection or national security but then like if you applied that to any other product, then it becomes way more obvious. Like yeah. the idea that someone would steal money for you to give you clothing. And it's like, well, why can't I, I can I just use my own money and get clothing. I mean, it, security is really not that crazy of a concept that, you know, we're stealing money for you from, from you from security. Like wouldn't it make more sense to let me keep my own money. And yeah, I would probably most likely be, have a better idea of how to protect myself with that given money. Um, you know, I mean, obviously then some people go into, oh, well, you know, some people aren't as good off and I mean, we could go on another whole tangent of where that goes. But the next point Spooner goes into how it's never even bound anyone to begin with. So, you know, the opening lines, the constitution not only binds nobody now, but it never did bind anyone. Uh, he goes into a written, uh, a written instrument binds no one until he assigned it. Uh, basically, you know, the idea that like we have a fucking, if you're going to have a fucking, um, if we are going to have a, um, you know, this contract, you know, the idea is that like, well, I mean, you know, it would make sense to sign it. Um, so here's a, a good line. Where would be the end of fraud and litigation if one party could bring into court a written instrument without any signature and claim to have it enforced upon the ground that was written for another man to sign, that this other man had promised to sign it, that he ought to have signed it, that he had had the opportunity to sign it if he would, but that he refused or neglected to do so. Yet that is the most that could ever be said of the Constitution. The very judges who profess to derive all their authority from the Constitution from an instrument, instrument that nobody ever signed would spurn any other instrument not signed that should be brought before them for adjudication. Which, I mean, a, a small pit. The, the grounds that the Constitution, the contract as the Constitution is starts at, that it would be scoffed at to bring into a minor court, into like a, a small claims court. Like, it, like it, it would barely even rise. And I know, I mean, I'm not a legal expert, but I know they say like even verbal contracts sometimes hold. I mean, you need some sort of proof. But even then, like it doesn't even really rise to that. There's there, there's nothing there. Like the, the idea that me by being born somehow bo brought me into this contract is ridiculous. And it's the only contract that supposedly is legit without following the rules of any other contract. Um, so yeah, you got anything? Yeah. Well, there. we got a couple of legal, legal experts. We know that we could ask about this. Uh, <laughs> I'll just leave that, but, uh, the, uh, um, yeah, I mean, I think that you're right that, you know, we, we, what we do is we just kind of have these excuses for military defense, welfare, whatever. We don't think about it in any other type of circumstance. And then as soon as you do, it just falls apart. So, Obviously, any contract has to be signed by two people. There has to be a mutual agreement. Um, but as Spooner points out, like even in the day of the signing, there wasn't a legal contract between the government and all the people. Like not all the people had signed it. Why do these people that came forward to sign the Constitution, why do they represent all of these other people? You know, they didn't all choose them. There's no contract proving that this guy was sent you know, to represent all these people. Uh, so it's just how he completely destroys any of this argument from the inside out. It's just like logically falls apart. So, um, I mean, you can do this with anything in the government though. And I mean, this is why it turned me into, I think it's, 
it, it didn't really turn me into an anarchist. That's the wrong way to put it. It just like made me understand that I am an anarchist, I think, because then as soon as you start applying this thinking to any other area of the government, you realize how bullshit it all is. Yeah, I mean, he goes on further, too, with another section about this. And, like, he goes, if the people of this country wish to maintain such a government as the Constitution describes, there's no reason in the world why they should not sign the instrument in them itself and thus make known their wishes in an open, authentic manner, in such manner as the common sense and experience of mankind have shown to be reasonable and necessary in such cases, and in such manner as to make themselves as they ought to do, individually responsible for the acts of the government. Uh, which that's a big point he touches on too, and, and I think we'll get into that later about you know how you're you, they aren't responsible, you're not responsible for them, and they aren't responsible for you. So the idea that you're they are your agents is ridiculous. And I mean yeah. that just kind of is a bookend off the the previous part where he goes into how you know if if we're going to have this, I mean why can't we sign it? There's no reason. I mean I know Michael Humer. I know if a lot of people like he goes into this and like social contract theory, and the whole idea is like. One of the big things in social contract theory they go on is like, oh, well, it's just presumed. One of, the, one of the major theories is like with social contracts is like, oh, it's just presumed you signed it. And it's like, well, why? Just have me sign it. I mean, you can't just assume that I would sign something unless you – like that's not how contracts work. And like if it was something that you're just going to assume I would do, then you might as well just give it to me and then I can tell you for sure. But you don't because you know the answer would be no <laughs> like, for a lot of people. So, yeah. 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 Um, and the next section he goes into like on what authority does it, they even do it to begin with um so you got it basically goes like let me see how to break this one down um he kind of goes into how like the most that can really be said is that you know some people uh have a tacit understanding they'll maintain a government you know uh so the idea being that there are some people who fucking you know do vote and in their heads they provide consent and there's one line in the book at some point where he's like you know basically every government in the world that uh is is con is uh, a consenting government to those that consent so there are even within our current government there are people who consent so there are people who agree to this there are people who you know accept their fucking chains or whatever and that's that's fine but that's not that doesn't really hold up for every one of them um but yeah, I guess that's really all I have in that section. He kind of goes on a different, uh, different one. Um, he got, and then he kind of goes into like why a secret ballot because he, one of the previous points in there he goes into is how it's a secret ballot and that's why they don't have any authority. Um, and he he goes like other Confederates in crime, those who use it are not friends but enemies, and they are afraid to be known and to have their individual doings known even to each other. Which I feel like, especially in modern days, this uh. I know we like to think of the government as a singular institution in some ways, but that's very much not the case. There are definitely, definitely differing factions, and I guess to some extent they do work together, but, uh, I mean, it's, it's definitely not this unified front that we think it is, although in a certain way it also kind of is. It's like that thing, you know, when it's, ever it's time to vote for fucking funding for Israel, they'll all come together. But they do have legitimate grievances among each other, and these are people that have their own ends that will throw each other under the bus. And there's a reason why these things are a lot of a lot of the stuff that the government done is done in secret and they really can't be held to account. Um, and I know that's a big thing you talk about with like all the Epstein stuff and shit like that. So, <laughs> yeah, I think um, the government is becoming what it was meant to be in its constitutional form. You know, like we're, we, we keep hearing people say, like, if we followed the Constitution, if we did like I kind of think the government was designed to get where it is now you know like I, I don't really think that the i mean obviously the quote about the constitution you know being unfit to exist i think that's accurate but i think the way it was set up was to get here i mean it happened so quickly it was already on that you know it was on the road here pretty obviously when the people who signed the constitution died like by that point it was already obvious that we were headed in this direction so um i think you know, that, um, you know, we shouldn't be surprised that that's the way it is, that, you know, they're always trying to enrich themselves. There's individual goals and agendas going on, even though, like you said, there are some pervasive, you know, obvious agendas that keep the beast alive. But then you've also got all these people trying to better themselves. And so why wouldn't they? We're all humans, you know. Um, I mean, government in itself is 
anti-capitalist, which is a Murray Rothbard quote from Anatomy of the State. And that's, uh, you know, I, I don't think so. I think socialism doesn't work because we're all capitalists, you know. And so that, that kind of breaks it down right there. Like if we're all self-serving individuals, how can you expect government to be some like, um, you know, some like extra human force that, you know, is above the faults of humanity. It does, of course, they would be just as corrupt and stupid and selfish and idiotic as the rest of us are, I guess. If not more so in some ways. <laughs> right. It's funny. People always, I, I, I brought this up plenty of times in the show, but people always, you know, is, is the government evil? Is it stupid? And it's like, well, it's kind of both. I mean, you have a bunch <laughs> yeah. of stupid people and a few evil people who are just really good at being evil and they kind of lead the stupid people because stupid people are easy to lead. And that's, you know, as I mean, being active duty military prior, I can tell you that was very, I mean, I don't know, maybe it's say say evil, but there are definitely people who are, have vie for power and they rise to the ranks and they're able to lead the dumb people. But there's also dumb people that even get to high spots because <coughs> just, you know, like that's just how it works. Uh, but Didn't, uh, Tom would say there's the evil party and the stupid party. And occasionally they get together and do something stupid and evil. That, that sounds like a Tom quote. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that before. I don't know if that's Tom or not. All right. The next section, he kind of goes into the idea that, you know, that, the, that we are the government or that like, you know, like we are the same as the government or whatever. And he's kind of building off of the previous thing of like how it's a secret fucking ballot. And as such, you're not really able to say who is whose agent and the idea of being like, if they're making an oath to you or the people who profess them, it's a contract supposed to be like a two way thing. You know, right. if, some, if someone is my agent you know, like the, I'm responsible for their shit, you know, if, as long as they're acting within the purview that I gave them, um, but he goes into this, like, since they can show no credentials from the people themselves, they were never appointed as agents or, or representatives in any open, authentic manner. They do not themselves know and have no means of knowing and cannot prove who their principles, as they call them, are individually and consequently cannot in law or reason be said to have any principles at all. And he's kind of going to the idea that, like, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a person, uh, I don't know, fucking, who's, who's the one-eyed guy, fucking, that, that neocon fuck. Yeah, like say somebody like him, like people voted him in, but it's like you can't, you can't, he doesn't know who voted him. And it's like people, you know, people always run as like, he, you know, I'm gonna, they run on a certain platform and then, you know, like this is what people vote for them for. So in a sense, they, they, when people voted for them, they voted for that. But now, like when the time comes for him to fulfill his side of the contract, supposedly, if we're going by this supposed contract theory, uh, and the, he's supposedly their agent, if he breaks away from that, which they do, all the fucking time, all the time, almost every single time. Uh, I mean, you, I, I feel like you'd be hard pressed to find one that doesn't, you know, isn't actually an agent of his voters. Um, it, it's it's one of those things where it's like, well, what are you going to do? Like, there's no because it's not open and authentic and it's a secret ballot. You don't have this ability for someone to take him to court and be like, hey, I voted for you for this. And we had a contract and you didn't fucking fulfill your side of the contract and fuck you and they're like so this is the whole idea of you can vote them in and it's like okay but they can do whatever they want and uh it, it is in a case he's kind of dispelling the whole idea of that we are the government in that section um yeah it's an interesting thought experiment if we actually did voting that way so imagine if it is public on the record and let's say government is a public option so if you decide to not vote you opt out <laughs> and you uh, you aren't affected by the government anymore. But if you do vote, you have a contract to the person you voted for. And if he wins, you know, then it's your fault. But you also have, uh, you know, recourse if he doesn't um, follow through. It's kind of an interesting thought experiment to try to envision that in real life. Like if we actually tried that. Oh, it'd be a nightmare. The litigation would be ridiculous. But that would be like, even if it wasn't voluntary, even if it was still the same system, but the only difference is everything is on the up and up. You can see who voted for who. That They had some sort of full on platform. This is what I'm going to vote for. And you can hold me to account in whatever way, you know, how this contract works. And if I don't fulfill it, you know, here's your recourse. Yeah, things would be way different. Obviously, it would still fall to shit because, oh, yeah, I mean, and that's that's what anatomy of the state does really good at breaking down is how, like, no matter how you do this, they will find loopholes around. And, you know, it, there's no such thing as a 
perfect constitution. Like it, it's just words on paper. Like, I mean, I think there was just this quote recently of Justin Trudeau. I don't know if you saw that. Um, I wish I could know more context on it, but oh, he, yeah, the, the democracy quote. Like, yeah. <laughs> oh man, that was terrifying. <laughs> yeah, that one was wild because it was straight up like, I mean, to put it in terms of us with the constitution, because I don't remember what their thing is, it would be basically no different if Biden came out and was like, okay, I know it says this in the constitution, but. And I'm not supposed care. to do it, but I'm going to do it. <laughs> That's basically what he said. And yeah. it, I'm not even like really being uh, facetious here. That's really basically – I'm not even really trying to take him out of context. I mean he did throw – to be fair, he did throw in a little bit about emergency powers. But it's like he basically was straight up like, yeah, I'm not supposed to do this. This is a fundamental – he even said you know, your fundamental rights. It's like, but we can – you know, but I'm going to – you know go against your fundamental rights here and it's yeah, like well it then they're not really awesome. fundamental rights then are they <laughs> like, yeah so. i mean i i couldn't believe it was real at first after yeah. listening, i had to watch it twice i was like what i thought it was a deep fake or something but i was like wow that is absolutely horrifying yeah uh here's another thing he goes into how the oaths are given to no one and which we, we kind of talked on that before because he goes into how they're secret um you know being as it's a secret ballot it's given to no one um but yeah, that's that's the next one. Boo, boo, boo. Let me see. So the great body of people that is men, women, and children were never asked or even permitted to signify in any formal manner, either openly or secretly, their choice or wish on the subject. So in the idea being, you know, as we touched on before, a contract goes both ways. Um, so you know, like it's. I mean, he says in the case of an oath, but the idea being that, like, he, I guess, I guess he more means it like a contract, or like in the idea being that, like if someone is making a contract with you, it needs to go both ways. Uh, and he kind of goes into that doesn't really happen. Um, um, here's another I feel like one. that kind of breaks down his whole argument here is the, the two way contract. Like that, is, like if you had to condense the entire thing, that's what it comes down to. Like you didn't sign shit. You don't have any actual representation here. You don't have a choice to opt in or out. It's a one-way contract, which makes no sense. I mean, that's kind of like the crux of his entire philosophy here. Yeah, and this whole section kind of sums up, it, too. He goes into how they really have no duty to you on their end. Right. But then on the, the flip side, the, no section go, the next section goes, but on the other side, uh, they have no duty to each other as well. Uh, it says, for the same reasons the oaths of all the other pretended agents of the secret band of robbers and murderers are on general principles of law and reason, equally destitute of obligation. They are given to nobody but to the winds. Uh, and he goes in this whole section is how even, like he gives a, I mean, I guess I could read this whole big section, but he goes into how they don't even have a duty to each other. And he, the, the situation he provides is say there's some random agent of the government. And if say they decide, just be like, I'm sure I could think of a, a, a contemporary example of someone who just says wild shit and doesn't really do what would necessarily be considered what they're supposed to do. But it's like, well, they don't have any duty to each other. I mean, just as they have no duty to us and we have no duty to them, they don't have any duty to each other. So um, let me see. So he, and he says for this, I'll, I'll read this is a big section, but it, it's, it's, it's a good way it breaks it down. He kind of goes into how if someone did that, he, the a sufficient answer for him to say to them would be, I never knew you. You never made yourselves individually known to me. I never gave my oath to you as individuals. You may or you may not be members of that secret band who appoint agents to rob and murder other people, but who are cautious not to make themselves individually known, either to such agents or to those whom their agents are commissioned to rob. If you are members of that band, you have given me no proof that you have ever commissioned me to rob others for your benefit. I never knew you as individuals and, of course, never promised you that I would pay you pay over to you the proceeds of my robberies. I committed my robberies on my own account and for my own profit. If you thought I was fool enough to allow you to keep yourselves concealed and use me as your tool for robbing other persons, or that I would take all the personal risk of the robberies and pay over the proceeds to you, you were particularly simple. As I took all the risk of my robberies, I proposed to take all the profits. Be gone. You were fools as well as villains. If I gave my oath to anybody, I gave it to the other persons as you. But I really gave it to nobody. I only gave it to the winds. It answered my purpose at the time. It enabled me to get the money I was after, and now I propose to keep it. If you expected me to pay it over to you, you relied up only upon that honor that is said to prevail among thieves. You now understand that that is a very poor reliance. I trust you may become wise enough to never rely upon it again. If I have any duty in the matter, it is to give back the money to those from whom I took it, not to pay it over to such villains as you. Which, I mean, it is, it is kind of great how he points out that it's kind of like they, being government agents, they technically really have no 
oath to each other either. So it's kind of like they can do rampant corrupt shit. And it's really like in what you know logical way can you really hold them to account? You know, yeah, and, and that also backs up what I was saying earlier about problem with socialism is we're all capitalists. Like, what do you expect these individual government agents to do other than try to better themselves? I mean, I'll I think there's a very rare occasion where you do get someone like Ron Paul who's in there who actually was like trying to make a difference and trying to achieve justice or whatever. But that's so, so rare. Like, of course, the vast majority of people are going to be in there to make a career to make a name for themselves. And in the process, they're going to make as much money and gain as much power as they can. So obviously that's going to involve corruption, fraud, uh, bribes, you know, all sorts of treachery. Yeah. And, uh, for sure. And then the next point goes into, now he starts going into a lot of how different oaths aren't legit. And he goes into the oath of naturalization, which would be for like immigrants. Cause at one point in the book, I believe it might've been earlier. Uh, he goes into how, like, at least with somebody like a, a someone who's coming in from another country, it's a little bit more legit because they actually have to make an oath to come in. Now, if somebody like me or you who was born in the country, it's presumed we just fall under this fucking contract. But now right. like somebody who came in, uh, you know, and has to give that oath, they go into based on all the logical proofs he provided preceding this. He goes to do well because of this, even they don't have any actual oath. And, one of the big things he goes into is how it's the same thing as it's, you know, because there's no corporation that is the government because no one ever really signed a legit contract. They have no, you know, no actual duty to anyone. They can just say these words and they mean nothing because it's you're you're making an oath to the United the government of the United States, which in a sense is to some extent a great fiction. It's just a band of robbers, as he says. Um, and I do. It is really cool. I. This is probably – well, it is a little bit like more boring and dry, this part, but it's like kind of like these things he had been building on previously build up to where you're like, oh, like these logics build on each other to where you're like, okay, that makes sense. And it, yeah, and then he goes into how for the same exact reason the, the oaths of the Confederates you know, were are invalid because a lot of people don't realize this book was written in the context of after the Civil War. And if you read this, right. he actually makes an argument for why they should have been able to secede. Uh, it's kind of like a little bit here and there in the book. And it's, I think it's a big part of the last chapter and the idea being that they should have been allowed to. And then everyone accuses people that say that being racist, but Spooner was probably one of the most hardcore anti-slavery voices yeah. ever. <laughs> like, he yeah. legit. And that's kind of what I was getting at earlier with like reading his other works. If you read some of his other works, it's heavily implied. He was straight up like, arming revolutions and shit of slaves and stuff like and he is on the record saying that the, the the slaves should fucking kill their masters which doesn't sound that i mean even now it sounds a little bit crazy but especially in the context of the time that is no different than being like you know the people who are like woohoo january 6th like that's essentially the same if anything maybe even more base <laughs> like, actually way you know what it is way more based <laughs> yeah way more base. january 6th if you think it was anything other than a disappointment you're just not living in reality but yeah um, <laughs> Yeah. Um, let's see. Where were we? Um, the, the whole idea of like naturalization or whatever, like I think this is another like, um, you know, like Christianity parallel with me. Like it, it's always like, well, why didn't I get a shot at the Garden of Eden? You know, why, I was just born into original sin and I have no choice. I can't be perfect, but I can't know the truth either. Like, I don't know if this is real. Like, why'd you hide this and all these vagaries, you know, like if this is actually the real truth or whatever, it's a very similar idea to like, this is just so unfair. Like I, I didn't like, you know, why don't I get to decide if I am going to exist or not? You know, if these are the consequences of like, I might end up burning in hell for eternity. Maybe I just rather never have the chance of existing at all, but I don't have any choice in the matter. It's just like, hey, hopefully you end up in a circumstance of your life where you are led to believe the correct things and then you'll end up in heaven. And I was just like, what the fuck is that? You know, like that doesn't seem fair at all. And then that's a very <laughs> mirrored, you know, similarity to what he's talking about with if you're born into a country, suddenly you're under all these obligations and contracts that you never had any say in yourself. And uh, it's even more egregious because it's like, you know, use of force against you in real life that you never agreed to. So, yeah. 
And then the next one he goes into is how military oaths are invalid for the same exact reasons. I mean, he does add a little bit more flavor to each of these for like with the Confederate one he goes into is literally under coercion because after, you know, the civil war, it was very much a fucking, you know, all right, bitches, like you need to agree to this. Um, but with the military oaths ones, he does add that like, like basically like a lot of these have basically all the same, a lot of the same reasons, but then little different things. Like for example, the military oaths, he, the, he adds a little bit of flavor of, Independ independently of the criminality of an oath that for a given number of years he will kill all whom he may be commanded to kill without exercising his own judgment or conscience as to the justice or necessity of such killing and you know, so he's obviously going to like even if you know it was legit then you have the added thing of like you're literally being contracted to fucking do criminal things so you know right. in a in a court of law that would be thrown out. <laughs> so they'd be like, no, this contract's not valid. Yeah. But then you add into that all the other things of how it's a secret ballot. This is an oath given to the wind. There's not really, I know someone mentioned that the United States is literally a corporation. Sure. But when he's saying corporation in the book, he was more meaning in like a group of people who made an agreement amongst each other. And that this agreement was never legitimate. I get what you mean though. And like a corporation being, you know, it's modern version, which is just this thing of the government. Um, I do like to I would like to add my own little thing with the military oath. Like even if you buy into the whole constitution thing, um, uh, and this is something I've said before, if you look into the constitution what it says, the military oath, the I mean the irony of the military oath is by taking it you break it like immediately because damn near everything we're, the military is doing is unconstitutional. So the very act of doing it you break it. Uh, so it, which is it's I don't know if it's like intentional or not, but I always thought it was kind of, it's almost this thing. Like when you get into like a mob or the mafia or whatever they have, they get dirt on you or, or they make you besmirch yourself a little bit. And it's almost like they, there's that little, little thing where there's like, you, you made this oath and you think it's valiant and all that shit. And then, but then when you realize you're like, wait, no, that's not legit. It's almost like they kind of have you by the balls a little bit in, in a certain weird kind of way. But yeah, I don't know if you have anything to add on that one. Yeah, I mean, you know, I just like his brutal honesty with what you are doing. Like, you are signing up to destroy property and murder people at the command of someone removing your own conscience. <laughs> you know, like, I think half of half of this book was just phrasing. You know, like, a lot of it you already realize is true, but just when you hear it described without any, you know, without any uh, polish... <laughs> then you're just like, oh, wow. Well, yeah, that is exactly what that is. Because yeah. what's false about that? You know, like, oh, no, it's justified because it's a government. Like, wait, why does a government justify murder? Like, on, you know, just because people are, yes, you know, having money stolen from them to support this infrastructure to command you to murder people, that justifies it. You know, you, then you just like start thinking outward from there. And you're like, wow, yeah, this is complete bullshit. So, I mean, good on Lysander for just like the, uh, you know, the black and white phrasing. I mean, just yeah. <laughs> he just puts it right to there. You know what yeah. I mean? I mean, to bring it back to Anatomy of State again, it's the same thing that goes to Anatomy of State. It's it's not even necessarily that they're intentionally being fucking uh, provocative. It's just they're being realistic. Like yeah. this is just blatant what it is with no flourish about it. It's and. I mean, you, you read it and it's like, you can be offended, but it's kind of like, well, I mean, he's completely explaining it to you as you go. So it's like, I, it's really hard to disagree with this. I, I have a hard time reading a lot of this stuff and disagree with next one. He goes into how treaties are invalid, you know? So like treaties between nations, because he goes the nations as they are called with whom are pretended ambassadors, secretaries, presidents, and senators profess to make treaties are as much myths as our own. So that, you know, if we can build out from uh, this whole, you know, breakdown we've given the Constitution and we can kind of thereby, you know, make the same conclusions with other governments. I mean, one of the only differences is that ours is supposedly based on consent, but I mean, we, we, we've been kind of going to the, how that's bullshit. Um, but yeah, so treaties with other nations, he goes into how debts are invalid as well. So, you know, let me see, do, 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 do. There's not one particle of legitimate evidence such as would be required to prove a private debt that can be produced against any one of them that either he or his properly authorized attorney ever contracted to pay one cent on debt. I mean, that's especially pertinent today. You know, that's the, the big thing, the debt. 
Like, everyone's like, oh, the debt, the debt. It's like, well, that's not my fucking debt. <laughs> like, yeah. I didn't I didn't agree to that. Like, I don't really give a shit. Like, I have nothing to do with this. And that's, I mean, there is some truth to that we will get stuck with it. But that's why we got to try to break away from the system as much as we can. Because if you don't, you will be stuck with that fucking debt. <laughs> um, yeah. I don't know if yeah. you have anything on that one. That was not, like, really a big realization for me, I guess. Like, I, I some of this stuff I was already in agreement with them. I don't know if it was like that for you with anatomy of the state, but I mean, I was already a libertarian. So I already agreed on like this point It was just some of the other ones that were just like, Oh yeah, well, duh, obviously like, you know, minarchy is still theft. It's still extortion. It's still force, you know? Um, but, uh, yeah, with the debt, like uh, throughout 2020, uh, you know, it, it just became more and more obvious. Like, the only reason you are ever going to get fucked by this is if you are still using dollars and you still have assets that are valued in only dollars. Like that's how you're going to get screwed. So have assets that are valuable outside of just being dollars. And you're right. I mean, we got to just, <laughs> we got to, you know, kind of uh, get ourselves off the system because it's not our fault. Like I had no say in spending all that money. Like every time I ever, I mean, even if you consider voting, a legitimate thing then you know i always voted against spending more money so if it is truly consensual then i didn't consent to any of that money being spent right so <laughs> how can you stick me with any of this debt but as long as you're in the system you'll get stuck with it yeah and here's the next part that he gets to this is where he gets especially based and i don't know if he was ahead of his time or what but this is one of those things that like even today, for a lot of people, is like borderline a conspiracy theory. But if you really think about it, it's not. Like, and he goes into who really is the government, and that's money lenders. Uh, so the international money lenders. And he goes into, you know, he literally calls out the Rothschilds in here. Uh, so who composed the real governing power in the country? Who are the men, the responsible men who rob us of our property, refrain us of our, restrain us of our liberty, subject us to their arbitrary domination? and devastate our homes and shoot us down by the hundreds of thousands if we resist. How shall we find these men? How shall we know them from others? How will she defend ourselves and our property against them? Who of our neighbors are members of the secret band of robbers and murderers? How can we know which are their houses that we may burn or demolish them? Which their property that we may destroy it? Which are their persons that we may kill them and rid the world and ourselves of such tyrants and monsters? And he totally builds off of this to get to the point where he legitimately is straight up basically calling for the heads of the money lenders <laughs> uh -huh. which is mega based and a hundred percent true he goes only those who have the will and the power to shoot down their fellow men are the real rulers in this as in all other so-called civilized countries for by no for by no others will civilized men be robbed or enslaved and from there he basically does the follow the money uh you know who are these people who do it and he said, as a necessary consequence, those who stand ready to furnish this money are the real rulers. The money that is required to do that act I mentioned previously, the fucking, you know, essentially, you know, uh, shooting down your fellow man. Um, he goes, the Rothschilds and that class of moneylenders of whom they are the representatives and agents, men who never think, think of lending a shilling to their next door neighbors for purposes of honest industry and less upon the most ample security at the highest rate of interest stand ready at all times to lend money in unlimited amounts to those robbers and murderers who call themselves governments to be expended in shooting down those who do not submit quietly to being robbed and enslaved. And to bring this back a little bit to the Epstein thing, like this yeah, is kind of why saying. shit like that is kind of important because it's like these are a lot of the people that are in these things, like the big players. And like, I mean, I don't know if necessarily the Rothschilds and shit like that went there, but – it's like, I feel like if you follow the breadcrumbs, it gets back to that. Like, the real people in power, these are the people doing the fucked up shit. Like, we look at the government and think they're elites, but there are elites above the elites that we never really see, hardly. And it's the people like the Rothschilds and the, uh, I mean, I'm sure, I can't think of any other, uh, I can't think of any others off the top of my head, but there's multiple other ones, the international money lenders. Um, but he goes, and why are these men so ready to lend money for murdering their fellow men? Solely for this reason, that such loans are considered better investments than loans for purposes of honest industry. They pay higher rates of interest and is less trouble to look after them. That is the whole matter. So it really does come down to money, which I mean, I guess in a weird way for us being capitalists, it's almost like you can almost sympathize. But then you're like, wait, like it's I, I, it's kind of no different than like hiring a hitman or something. It's kind of like, well, no, that's not OK. Like, you right. know what this is being used for. 
And it's kind of hard. To, I mean, I guess a lot of people maybe make some justifications be like, for them, but at some point you're going to be like, they know what they're spending money for. Um, and he kind of goes into like where they're at. The, they go, they care no more for a king or an emperor than they do for a beggar, except as he is a better customer and can pay them better interest for their money. And um, it, it, it keeps on going. Um, and then he kind of goes into how they operate. And this is how we get a lot of these like monopolies and like money and stuff. He goes, in addition to paying the interest in the bonds, they perhaps grant to the holders of them Great monopolies in banking, like the banks of England, of France, and of Vienna, with the agreement that these banks shall furnish money whenever, in sudden emergencies, it may be necessary to shoot down more of their people. And that's where we get a lot of these, you know, things like the central banks and stuff like that, because they, over the past and as time goes on, it pervades other places, but they grant these money lenders monopolies in certain areas. That way, they can, you know, essentially move in different ways. Essentially, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know if you have anything. Let me see. I got a lot you, to add here. Or a lot yeah. To, to well, well, <laughs> one more. And, and, and think of Gaddafi as I say this. Um, he says we – he kind of goes into essentially like if they like if, you know, say a fucking – some king or emperor or president decides to, you know, not really do what these money lenders want. He said we will unmake them, strip them of their goo uh, gaws, and send them out into the world as beggars or give them over to the vengeance of the people they have enslaved. The moment they refuse to commit any crime we require of them, or to pay over to, uh, to us such share of the proceeds of their robberies as we see fit to demand. Which, yeah. I mean, this is Not kind of... The... Saddam Hussein. <laughs> uh, you know, like, anyone you want to name. <laughs> yeah. right, you said you got a lot in this one. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, this is uh, what I have been, you know, focusing on the last few weeks with the Epstein case. I mean... You got like the mega group, this group of Zionist billionaires, uh, specifically Les Wexner. He gave millions of dollars to Epstein to finance all his properties where you're right. Like he wouldn't give a beggar a penny on the side of the road. So why would he do that? Why would he give millions of dollars to this rape ring? Well, it's the expansion of power because you have power over so many people. You know, why do we send billions of money, uh, billions uh, of dollars of, you know, aid to Israel every year. You know, why do we do all these giant weapons contracts with Saudi Arabia every year? It's all about power. Like it's the only thing that these people will spend money on is power. And, um, you know, like you said, it's pervasive. I just had Maria Farmer on my show and you had Bill Clinton and Donald Trump both in on this. And, um, yeah, it's just disgusting. I don't know. Like, it's just, um, you know, we, we think that, um, or you and I don't think, but most people think like there's this big transfer of power between like Biden and Trump and Obama and Bush, but it's the same people who are always running the show. Like this Epstein, just when Epstein was running this ring, it like started in the eighties and nineties. I mean, it goes back a few decades. He's been doing this throughout Bill Clinton's presidency, George Bush, Barack Obama, Donald Trump, uh, you know, now then he got ousted in uh, Donald Trump's reign. But this type of stuff is still happening right now, you know. And then you look at the, you know, even look at like the people who are appointed into positions of office, like uh, um, what's his name? Uh, who's the secretary of state right now? Anthony Blinken. Like yeah. it's not his first time serving in the defense sector at all. Like he did under uh, Obama, too. And I think think under bill clinton i can't remember if he was under bill clinton but then uh you know you look at like trump with everyone he had you know they'd been working for the neoconservatives you know it, none of these people actually go away it's just like this circulating mess of a few powerful people who actually decide what we do and then you know we vote for a president or whatever and we feel like we're actually making a difference but you're really not i mean it's really these powerful people who run everything yeah. And uh, I mean, one thing I was thinking while you were talking too is like the danger of this too is because a lot of people think of like the debt and like, ah, no big deal. And it's like kind of a big deal. And like, because there are people who expect to get their fucking money one way or the other. And the people that, you know, the government is knows they will be Gaddafi if they don't fucking do what they need to do one way or the other. And that's why this essentially the level of, you know, debt essentially is a great indicator of 
to what extent they are essentially, you know, cocked out by the fucking, uh, by the money lenders that will. So like, there's a reason why, you know, we have such contempt for certain states. You look at like Russia, I'm not saying they aren't cucked out at all, but it's like, you look at their fucking national debt and it's like, it's a little bit different than ours. <laughs> like, I mean, there's a reason why it's always Russia, Russia, Russia. Like they're the big bad. It's like, I mean, not to say Russia is, is good. I mean, obviously they're a government too and they have lots of issues, yeah. but it's, there's a reason why they're always painted as the big bad because they're not as in bed with the international money lenders as we are. Um, there's a reason why they're being painted such a way. And there's a reason why it's not going to be this easy thing of just being like, oh, we just won't pay. Well, we'll just default on the shit. Like, okay, that's kind of, I mean, yes, but it's also kind of not really an option. So it's like, yeah. how does this go? I don't know. The other thing is, you know, like there's something about progressives who believe in socialism, like you can't get this through to them. They don't understand, like, why are we still financing this war in Yemen? And it's like, well, <laughs> we have to because we are running huge trade deficits. We've, def you know, inflated our dollar away. The only way it has any value left is because it's the world reserve currency because OPEC honors the dollar as the petrodollar, to, you know, to trade oil around the world. That's the only reason we are still the top dog. Or not the only reason, but like the only big reason, you know, that we are financially the top dog still. So all these progressives who like want to expand our debt so much and don't care about when the bill comes due, it's like you don't realize you're feeding the system like you're keeping us dependent on Saudi Arabia. Um, also, like when you're trying to kill all of our in-house uh, oil production and energy, you know, to try to, you know, go green here, but we're still going to have to import a ton of oil to maintain our infrastructure because we can't run on all green energy. You're also like, <laughs> you, you know, you're feeding the beast. So it just drives me crazy with people who don't realize basically what you're just laying out there. Like the money lenders exist and the more dependent we are on them, the more heinous things we're going to do. And progressives just like can't understand why that cycle exists. It's like pull your head out of your ass, you know. It's, it just pisses me off. Yeah, and it kind of it kind of does a good job of fucking bringing it to. I mean, you can kind of apply our similar situation. It's very there's a lot of parallels, and he kind of sort of finishes out in comparing it to the 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 whole civil war situation, and he kind of goes into how. These money lenders, uh, essentially, the reason why we had this big bloody war is that we had a group that wanted to break away from it. This is going to affect the, the money lenders' bottom bottom dollar. So what they did is they essentially, you know, gave their little moral play of being like, "Oh, well, you know what? We're going to free the slaves." And it's like, right. but and he kind of goes into, "Well, you didn't really free the slaves. All you really did is made everyone unfree." Um, and like I love that quote. Do you yeah. have that quote written down there? Because that's an amazing quote. Let me see if I can find it. Do, 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 do. It's like we are uh, I, to believe that we have freed the slaves, but in reality, we've created. I forget how it's. Yeah. Written, but. Real quick, I'm going to do this one. These soulless, blood money loan mongers are the real rulers, that they rule from the most sordid and mercenary mo motives, that the ostensible government, the president, senators, and representatives so called are merely their tools, and that that no ideas of or regard for liberty or justice has anything to do with inducing them to lend their money for the war. I just like that one. I like him shitting on them. Um, in short, the North said to the slaveholders, if you will not pay us our price, give us control of your markets for assistance against your slaves, we will secure the same price, keep control of your markets by helping your slaves against you and using them as our tools for maintaining dominion over you. For the control of your markets we'll have, whether the tools we use for that purpose be black or, black or white, and be the cost in blood and money what it may. That might not be the one you were speaking of. I'm trying to see if I can find it. It's not that one does apply. That's but it's it. – yeah. Oh. Sorry, I didn't mean to sideline No, you you're good. You're good. You're good. Uh, da, da, da. And the whole affair on the part of those who furnish the money has been and now is a deliberate scheme of robbery and murder – not merely to monopolize the markets of self, but also to monopolize the currency and thus control the industry and trade and thus plunder and enslave the laborers of both North and South. I know that's not still it, but it's, it's also applicable here. I'm sure Ryan Dawson's getting a hard on hearing all these. Right. Words, like. <laughs> <laughs> and to hide at once, if possible, both their servility and their crimes, they attempt to divert public attention by crying out that they have abolished slavery. They have saved the country. They preserved our glorious union. <laughs> and that in now paying the national debt, as they call it, as if the people themselves, all of them who are to be taxed for his payment, had really involuntarily joined in contracting it, they are simply maintaining the national honor. 
I'm trying to find your fucking. Oh, yeah. What government except one resting upon the sword like the one we now have was ever capable of maintaining slavery? And why do these men abolish slavery? Not from any love of liberty in general, not as an act of justice to the black man himself, but only as a war measure. Because they wanted assistance and that is of, of his friends in carrying on the war they had undertaken for maintaining and intensifying that political, commercial, and industrial slavery to which they have subjected the great body of the people, both white and black. There was, you know, dot, dot, dot. There was no principle, difference of principle, but only of degree between the slavery they boast they have abolished and the slavery they were fighting to preserve. That That's probably the one you're thinking of. But yeah, that's the yeah. one. Yeah. No, uh, I, I do want to quickly do an aside of where Spooner was coming from. He was very against slavery. And I, I do want to say his arguments, his argument, one of his like practical arguments of why they should have been able to break away is that it would have created an economic incentive. Like say the North wanted to be slave free and the South didn't. Well, it's like essentially you would create a market for slaves moving there and they would, you know, like basically he was saying it would make slavery untenable. Uh, and it essentially would have had less bloodshed. And he actually thinks it probably would have gone away quicker because a lot of people don't realize slavery didn't fucking end with the Civil War. Uh, I'm sure. I don't know if you want to touch on that. I know you know that that shit way better than I do. Um, yeah, actually, uh, there was a quote you mentioned earlier where he's talking about, you know, the North would turn the slave owners slaves against them to help themselves. Uh, that's a direct uh, shot at the Emancipation Proclamation because the war went from was it 1860 to 1865, I think. And the Emancipation Proclamation was in 1863. And it only freed the slaves in the South. It didn't free any slaves in the North. You know, that's kind of weird (laughs) that you wouldn't free the slaves in the states that are fighting to supposedly end slavery. And then I think if you escaped to the North, you were allowed to fight in the army against the South. So it was obviously a political move. There was nothing actually, you know, um, benevolent about that. It wasn't about fighting for a cause. It was totally about like, you know, we don't really give a shit about your slaves, but they're free if they'll come up here and fight against you. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's basically what it Which, was. Yeah, they're they're free if they'll go be our slave in battle. <laughs> like, yeah. um, literally. And, and, yeah. and to bring up, I know a lot of people, you know, get all upset about this shit, but like, I do want to bring up. I think we're one of what two nations that's needed to fight a war to end slavery, you know, quote unquote. Cause like we just said, it didn't even really end slavery. It was just a political right. tool. It kind of, it sort of in a sense ended in its own you know time anyways. Um, but it, I don't know. Do you know the other one was it Haiti? I think there was another country that had to fight over slavery. I don't know. But point is pretty much every other country ended it and we didn't need to fight a war. So when people get all upset when you say, Hey, we shouldn't have fought, had the civil war or whatever they immediately go, Oh, well, you're racist or you, you like slavery. And it's like, okay, no, it would have ended one way or the other. And I like Spooner in one of his works completely makes a good economic argument for why fucking, if that was the case, it actually would have probably ended about the same, if not quicker and fucking, you know, with far less bloodshed because he essentially would have created economic incentives that, you know, made slavery not tenable. And a lot of people do know, too, I know there's a lot of economic arguments against slavery that wasn't really, you know, obviously it's immoral, but like even on the economic side, it's really not that smart. And over time, it kind of fell apart because it's, it's kind of hard to enslave a group of people and force them to work. And also, what kind of work are you really going to get out of that? Like, um, yeah. I know Thaddeus Russell does a lot of good work on that in his, uh, I think, um, Renegade History and like uh, a lot of how the slaves like w- behaved and stuff and how they it really wasn't this, I mean, not saying slavery was fun, but it wasn't the, it, essentially the, the, the fucking view we have of it in modern times. Um, yeah. Well, Adam Smith in wealth of nations, he talked about how slavery was not uh, economically advantageous. Like slaves were not going to work as hard or, you know, want to work as well as people who were being paid. And he was, but he, he died like a hundred years before the civil war started. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, he was in the 1700s, so yeah, a long time ago. Yeah, <laughs> like it wasn't like a brand new argument by any stretch. I mean, it had been around for a while. And then England, they they ended slavery like what in the 1820s or something. It was before us. So yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it wasn't a radical idea that oh, you know, slavery is not as economically advantageous, and maybe we should stop doing it. Like it was, 
it was happening around the world. It wasn't, um, you know, we were just, we were kind of lagging behind, but you didn't need to kill 600,000 people to end <laughs> slavery. <laughs> To do something that was going to happen anyways and probably would have happened about the same amount of time, if not even maybe a little bit quicker, if you follow the economic argument. So, yeah. um, uh, libertarians do follow the economic argument. That doesn't <laughs> work out well. Yeah. Uh, here's a little other quote that kind of fits here, but kind of not, but it's just a baller quote. So I have to. Uh, the only idea that have ever, the only idea they have ever manifested as to what is a government of consent is this that it is one to which everybody must consent or be shot. <laughs> um, the lesson taught by all these facts is this as long as mankind continue to pay national debt so called that is so long as they are such dupes and cowards as to pay for being cheated plundered enslaved and murdered so long as there will be enough to lend the money for those purposes and with that money a plenty of tools called soldiers can be hired to keep them in subjection but when they refuse any longer to pay for being thus cheated Plundered, enslaved, and murdered, they will cease to have cheats and usurpers and robbers and murderers and blood money loan mongers for masters, which I, I put a little note for agorism there as well. But I mean, whatever tool you can get to try to wrest away, you know, the fucking the money power, because that's where it all comes down to is money. And I know everybody's like, oh, they can print more, but it's like, you know, what's why you get, get into other currencies or, you know, and even then, even if you are just using normal currencies, if you're doing your best to not have them have as much, it's you know, like it's still, you know, benefiting yourself. I mean, I know it's hard to, you know, imagine that that, that little bit it makes a difference, but it, it fucking does. Yeah. Um, and with that, we're at the end. I don't know if you have anything on that one. I don't, I don't really have, I mean, we were kind of, it was on the same topic we were touching on. Um, and then it kind of finishes off with a little appendix, which is, that's where the last line comes in. It says, but whether the constitution really be one thing or another, this much is certain that has either authorized such a government as we have had or been powerless to prevent it. In either case is unfit to exist. You know, I'm going to read the whole appendix because it's, it's pretty short and uh, sure. it kind of is a good little bookend. Inasmuch as the Constitution was never signed nor agreed to by anybody as a contract and therefore never bound anybody, is now bond, binding upon nobody and is moreover such as one as no people can hear can ever hereafter be expected consent to except as they may be forced to do so at the point of the bayonet is perhaps of no importance what its true legal meaning is, as a contract is. Nevertheless, the writer thinks it proper to say that, in his opinion, the Constitution is no such instrument as has been generally been assumed to be, but that by false interpretations and naked usurpations, the government has been made in practice a very widely and almost wholly different thing from what the Constitution itself purports to authorize. He has therefore written much and could write much more to prove that such is the truth. And then the, but whether the Constitution be one thing or another, this much is certain that has either authorized such a government as we have had or been powerless to prevent it. In either case, it is unfit to exist. And Spooner's base is fuck. <laughs> yeah. So obviously, I heard the quote before I read the book. That was why I read the book because I heard the quote so many times and so many people told me I had to read it. I think I read it in it was February or March of last year. I can't remember. It was early last year. But, um, that line just kind of encapsulates 2020 so well. <laughs> I mean, like, what good is this piece of paper if we can do all this when we're supposedly following it, you know? So, I mean, like you said, either you're following it and it's led you here or you're not following it and it hasn't done anything to fucking stop it. So who gives a shit? Yeah, pretty much. And I like that last little bit. I wanted to read it all too because he does a very good job. Even though he doesn't hit up on all his arguments, but it's a good encapsulation of the entire thing. He kind of goes into like nothing about this is legit. Like this is just like it was made among people hundreds of years ago, a small group of people that like in the idea that it's binding upon us, people that had nothing to do with it is just fucking silly. And the idea that they, a contract was even to anyone in general and no one signed it. And I mean, it goes into way more. There, like we literally like tapped just tapped it a little bit. I highly suggest anyone reading this or listening to this, go, go fucking read it. Um, but yeah, um, with that, I guess we're kind of at the end. So, I mean, unless any super chats drop in the meantime, we're doing plugs. We'll, we'll probably finish it out. So I don't know if you want to drop your plugs real quick. Well, I, I just want to say like, yeah, uh, there was this kind of like, um, this debate that kind of started between Ryan Dawson and Dave Smith about anarchy versus minarchy. Um, <laughs> and I think it's a really dumb argument to have. Like, I think most people probably don't know I'm an anarchist. Most people who watch my show, because I just like never talk about it because I don't really care. Like, I mean, I think it's 
I think it's the logical conclusion. So that's where I've ended up. But, you know, I kind of agree uh, with, you know, and I think Dave would also say this, like people who just do nothing but talk about anarchy and nothing but talk about theory. And they're not like focusing on like, hey, you know, Epstein, the warfare state, COVID, you know, vaccine mandates, like all this shit. Like that's the stuff that I really focus on because I think it matters more. You know, I, I would rather ally with someone who believes in small government who is like extremely opposed to the big shit that's happening now than some anarchist who's just like you know who doesn't care about it like you know none of this is my fight i don't care you know whatever so i I call myself like a pragmatic anarchist (laughs) i mean i call myself libertarian but if i had to like classify what type of anarchist i just say like a pragmatic one like that's the that's true north is no government that's what we should strive for Um, I think a lot of personal decisions probably affect that more than political action. I think political action has a place. I know you and I like disagree on some of that strategically, but what matters most is that you live like an anarchist or like a libertarian that, you know, you're fiscally responsible, that you take care of people around you, take care of yourself. It's most important that you take care of yourself first, like make sure that you can be a beacon for other people and that you're financially stable enough to actually take care of your family and take care of your friends. Like if you're just in your parents' basement tweeting about Liberty from your computer, I think you're fucking useless. So I I just wanted to throw that in there though. But uh, I talk shit about me like that. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, that's your basement. So it's okay. (laughs) Um, But I, yeah, I'm yeah. Naturalist capitalist on YouTube, Odyssey, all the audio feeds um, at read underscore Coverdale on Twitter. They nuked my first account, but I'm back. I don't, I'm just kind of surprised I've stuck around this long, but I feel like I've kind of evaded them at this point if they don't, if they haven't already gotten rid of me. Um, and uh, I am not doing anything for a while now. Uh, the Four Horsemen is going to be on January 16th, and uh, James Corbett is going to be our fourth horseman. So that's going to be really interesting um no and, january yeah. 6 episode i'll have to do that's a good point i'll have to do something i'll have to do some <laughs> tribute on january 6 but yeah, it'd, be, uh, it'd be weird for you not to <laughs> i'll at least have to put out some banger tweets like i'm, re- I'm really looking forward to that that's going to be quite the anniversary yeah. celebration so <laughs> yeah on the anarchist minarchist thing i did want to touch on that real quick I, I agree with you it depends it's like minarchists are depends on what you mean but generally speaking yeah but at the same time it is also like people say they're minarchists but it's like to some extent, that is like, oh, I agree. There are some just some, uh, you know, legitimacy to government here and there. It depends on what they mean by minarchist. Like, well, like Ron Paul. I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, I don't know. I I'm gonna be straight. Up. I think he's a fucking anarchist. <laughs> yeah, he did make a tweet last year that made me feel like, wow, maybe you're. Yeah. It sounded like Lysander Spooner. <laughs> I don't. I didn't like watch. I don't really watch anymore, but I used to watch the Liberty Report a lot, and he'd say stuff, and I'm like, I'm pretty sure you're an anarchist, and you're just not saying it because you know that's like that'll throw off a lot of your base, and that's fair. I mean, I'm not even like shitting on him. It's like, right. But you know, I I don't know. I. I, I it is like the point I'm getting at is that they do grant some legitimacy and then it, I guess it depends what we're talking about. You have to get down the nitty gritty, but then it like, it, it becomes issues. It's like, well, what are you granting legitimacy for? Like, it, Oh, this is okay. And you lead into some issues. Um, but generally speaking, I, I, I totally agree. Like, um, I mean, it, at the end of the day, if they want the smallest government possible, it's like, yeah, me too. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> that is the, uh, the no government, but whatever, you know, like we can quibble about that when we get there. I guess. Um, yeah, once we get to small government, we can argue about that. And we're never going to get there anyway, yeah. so who cares? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and with that, this is, a, like I said, this is a No Way Jose show. Uh, you can find me on YouTube. You can all, for all the major audio podcasters, Odyssey. Uh, my Twitter is at 2020 No Way Jose. Uh, if you want to support me, you can get me at patreon.com. It's just No Way Jose 2020. Like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. Really appreciate you having me. Having, not having me on. Uh, have coming on the show uh it, it was good i uh i was glad yeah, to have you on, yeah I'm, I'm really glad you had the beard uh this time of year because it fits better for the theme <laughs> yeah i need um, to grow it out a little bit and i'm sorry i'm not black and white that would have been perfect i could have done like a filter but <laughs> yeah i was telling top you should like redo the thumbnail and just like for christmas merch and just make your hair white and just throw a santa cap on you and there you go um <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, with, with that, we're out. I, like I said, I appreciate you coming on. Uh, it's been fun. I uh, hope this gets out to a lot of people. 
Uh, and I hope you guys are enjoying these anarchist handbook episodes. We'll be doing more. I don't really have the next one in mind yet. Uh, Big thing uh, for anyone listening out there, find me people for the fucking lefties. I have like, I'm such in a bubble that I don't really have very good lefties. Uh, and I can't have Sterner or not Sterner, but I can't have Magnus do every fucking lefty. That'd be just, you know, I gotta, I gotta have different people. But uh, yeah, like I said, I appreciate you coming on. And with that, we are out. Subscribe.